<laughs> Greetings. Welcome to ITR Live. I'm your host, Chris Hagano, and we really do have another fun-filled, action-packed episode of Iowa's most exciting conservative <laughs> podcast. So in the past, I have joked that uh, John Hendrickson often has a little bit of trouble getting the headset put on. And today, as I, just as we're kind of putting the wraps on the pre-production meeting, it just flies off the back of his head and down it. Yeah. And it was just a mess. And, and so I just immediately hit record. And so the guys are ready. And Chris Ingstead here scrambling to get his headset on before the music stops. And, and I, yeah, it's, we're just going to have some kind of fun today, guys. Right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so John, your day one of your opportunities to ride rag bry in the sweltering heat. Yeah. You, you missed out on one today. So yeah. Are you, okay. You, you, I, I, Get I out decide there. I'll wait till next year. Okay. Well, good. I won't. I will not be out there. <laughs> um, so we've had a we've had a good day so far today, gentlemen. Um, you know, we're recording this on a. Um, Wednesday, we'll get this out uh, tomorrow morning, but I uh, started the day off with my friend, uh, former acting attorney general, Matt Whitaker at West Side Conservative Breakfast. Uh, had a chance to, it was it was a really cool format. So he was the speaker. I, I don't want to take that anyone wanted me to share the stage with him, but but did it interview style, you know, where you see, we didn't sit down and do it, but stood up there mm-hmm. and had me ask him the questions. And, and it actually, I thought went really well because, People seemed engaged, and and it was it was really interesting. What what I enjoyed out of that this morning because it was very timely. In addition to talking about different legal matters, but Matt went at length about some of the the Trump prosecution and the special counsel, but then about uh, the Hunter Biden plea deal, which apparently today we've and I bring this up because we've talked about it before, was uh, rejected by the judge, but then maybe modified and brought back. But but I know Matt said that it's just unprecedented to give that kind of a sweetheart deal. Yeah. But so I'm actually glad to to hear from Matt that he said exactly what what my instincts were. Who's a former federal prosecutor? You never would have done that. And then to see one of our federal judges get it, understand it, tap the brakes just a little bit that, that this is just, it's too, too generous. So anyway, yep. so that started the morning out. That was great. And we're here in the office getting real work done and, uh, oh. and, and okay. So John wants to talk about tax policy, which is sort of an evergreen thing. But I, I was oh an, John's John's got an article up about income taxes. Yeah, guys. No, it's great. I mean, we'll we'll talk. I mean, it, it's it's what we do. <laughs> but um, this this uh, this article caught my caught my eye this morning in the Des Moines Register, and it is it's actually something that we'd been tracking for quite a while, um, but. Asking the question, did you lose your Medicaid coverage? Here's what you need to know. We've we've got lots of thoughts on this. Well, Chris. I mean, first of all, do you know? <laughs> okay, go. I've been talking. Go. I no, mean, just just go because I'm gonna I'm gonna get Chris. I, I, I need to get myself spun up a little bit. I here. know in the show notes you'll link to a couple foundation articles on here, but the the whole deal is during this COVID emergency, this federal emergency they declared, states were prohibited from from cutting people. Uh, excuse me, from, from, from removing people. If you were on Medicaid yes. during COVID, you had to stay on. They couldn't even ask the question if you were still eligible. Right. And so what we're getting to now is now that that, declo- that, that emergency declaration has expired, so states can now start reexamining the people and their roles and quite honestly going, do you still qualify? That's, that's what we're talking about here. So, so maybe, it, right? maybe in, okay. the, in the moment during the deal, you, you, lost, you lost your job. And you lost your uh, health care coverage, and so you're you're on the government uh, a plan here, right? And, it's, and we know that right. this is a joint federal and state project. It's it's up to the states to administer, so that's why it's sort of a state issue. And we we did some work last year that shows since you couldn't kick anybody off or remove them, I don't want to say right. sound cold, um, and then you kept adding people as you maybe know would, the number of folks in the program just ramped up drastically. Right. Right. Because because even people who then gained employment and gained health care coverage, the state was not allowed to move them off of, right. of the roles. And so finally, the, the emergency declaration has ended. The states can go back and see like, geez, do you actually have coverage? Right. What are your assets? Are you are you doing your part? Are you keeping us informed of things you need to? Right. Do you still qualify? That is that right. is the sum total of what they're doing. Some folks are losing their mind about it, like it's cruel. And and I guess just you know the 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 way my friend Kyle uh, summed it up in, in an article he did for us was, 
when people are receiving benefits they're not supposed to, that leaves less money for the government to do all the other stuff government does. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean we can't just spend on whatever we want in whatever amount we want? I was misinformed. No. 38, no. what are we at? 38 trillion, John? I thought we could just spend on whatever we wanted. And maybe the feds don't care, but again, this is a joint federal and state program. So, so the, you know, the state is responsible for a good deal of that. And, and, and the states, even the blue states, Chris, uh, still have some fiscal rules they have to play by. The states can't print money. Right. Most can't go into uh, obscene amounts of debt like the federal government can. Right. Uh, well, th- it obviously is it was absurd to carry this on if if maybe for a short period of time this was necessary as truly we had places it, people out of work you know I, I might add that a fair amount of those people who are out of work were because the government either the the feds or their state government maybe that, shut them down but that's what i that's what i'm getting at i mean i don't think you have to it, it strains credibility too much to think that maybe the progressives in Washington, D.C. wanted everyone on government health care. You know, maybe that we were just trying that out to see how it worked for everyone, because clearly you've got folks that uh, are lamenting the the loss of their their, you know, health care coverage, even though they don't qualify for it. Yep. So, you know, I mean, John, it's, it's similar to the issue you had written about. You had been writing about for years and, and Iowa finally passed some enhanced eligibility um, verification through its other sort of support systems. Right. And, and I know in some of your work years ago, you had found um, folks who are on some level of government support system, right? Uh, we, what we might think of as you know, food stamps or SNAP or whatever, right? And these sorts of things. And you had people drawing benefits from both states. Yep. You had people who now were employed and were still on it, right? And, and so all we're saying is back to the heart of this issue is if you don't actually qualify anymore, right? You don't actually need the help, then quit taking it because you're actually just taking those dollars from somebody or something that truly deserves it. That's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, know, and, yeah. and we've supported this um, in other areas where states should have every opportunity to make sure that only the folks that need to get the benefit to, to save resources. I mean, this is common sense, but yet we saw well, we can we can and should have debates about who qualifies or even what the rules are. Right. right. Legislatively. Otherwise, if you want to change the rules, change the rules. But, yeah. But. I, it, what blows my mind is, is that we can't agree. Well, these are the rules we all need to follow. This, this well, selective, um, which rules we'll follow, which ones we won't, is is again is mind blowing to me. And just to add on 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 that is it's it's one thing to have to verify people who's on there, but I I think another good area reform that all states should do is uh, work requirements. Mm-hmm. And that sounds sometimes cruel, uh, but if you think if you look at where states have implemented work requirements for for uh, Medicaid it actually reduces poverty moving people off those roles uh, which is a, a win-win for everyone mm-hmm. especially for those who are moving from poverty into the middle class and so um, you know some of these welfare reforms are are very necessary well it's, it's like Chris says it's almost like the government wants you beholden to their government program it, yeah it, it's it it showcases a difference in philosophy. Yeah. You know, and it's maybe it's simply put as a hand up, not a handout. Is that it, it, obviously there are folks that will need a government assistance probably for the rest of their lives, <clears throat> disabled or, or whatever it is. Fine. That, that's not what we're talking about here, but it should not be easier to be on the assistance than to, than to avail yourselves of the path off the assistance. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, we're not trying to be Chris, onerous. How- it's not about the chain gang. It's not about, you know, all of that. It's a, it's, it's not about extracting a pound of flesh. It's, it's just simply saying, look, work is a better path. Yes. Chris, for, for about three or four years in Iowa, we went from 580,000 people to 600,000 people on Medicaid. Right. Okay. So, so that's fairly steady, right? I mean, 20,000 people difference over three or four years. Okay. But, but then just from the length of the pandemic, we went from uh, 600,000 to 763,000. Yeah. Right. So, so a four year, a four year, you know, run is, is up 20,000. And then the, during the pandemic, it's up 160. Do we, do we, 
Well, and I would submit that, look, it's already on an expanded population because Iowa did Medicaid expansion. I mean, these, this is a very, very expensive yes. program. Yeah. I mean, yes, it is driven by federal dollars. It is very expensive to the taxpayers of the state mm-hmm. at, the, at the, the benefits that are offered, who gets it, and, and then even expanded this. And all taxpayers should care that, yeah. okay, if we're going to extend this benefit, that it's done the right way. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. one of the, uh, 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 when, you, when you take, Basically, DHS, which a large part of that mm-hmm. is, is Medicaid with education. I mean, that's that's basically yeah. our entire general fund budget, over 80% of that general fund budget. And I believe it, and I don't know if it still is, but I think Medicaid was one of the fastest growing uh, uh, pieces yes. of our state budget was spending on on Medicaid. Yes, it, it is health care. Health care, what, what, what's the, the phrase? Educate, uh, Medicaid. And incarcerate are the two th- are the yeah. three things that the that the state does, and it consumes the the lion's share, and it's all on autopilot. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> one more point, and then I think we'll move on, is that you know that we have this amount of consternation of getting people that don't qualify mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. I mean, imagine the consternation that's going to happen when the federal government almost inevitably backs up on their commitment. Yes. Yep. You know, so when we talk about these things like federalism mm-hmm. and, and looking to the future, I mean, th- there's a, there's a concrete example of where the rubber meets the road yes. on that. So, okay, well, good. Federal or uh, state government doing the right thing, run these uh, tests, get it done. Right. Right. Yep. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, John, in our brief pre-production meeting, you had one ask. Can we talk about tax policy? Yeah. But um, yes, we can, John. We're Iowans for tax relief. We can talk about tax policy. Um, And we touched on this uh, a little bit in a previous episode, not just tax policy, but Iowa being the gold standard, mm-hmm. Iowa being in this recent round of, of this, this flat tax revolution that Iowa leading the way. But I think you want to, you want to hang a little bit more on that statement. And, do, yeah. and so yeah. I'm going to let you go yeah. from there. And, uh, um, you know, Iowa, Iowa is the gold standard. I would have argued uh, a few years ago that North Carolina was. You did argue. Yeah, I did ago. argue. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. But I, I, when you look at, and you know, we don't have time to go into rates because I don't want to bore people, but when you look at, uh, first of all, we're in a, the last few years have been probably the most historic since states have adopted the income tax. The, I mean, the m- number of states that have uh, cut income tax rates, over 40 states, 43, 45 states have, have done some form of income tax reform. I would argue that what Iowa did in 2022 is the most extensive of them all. And, and, and just for an example, um, yeah, for, you know, 1934 is when our income tax was implemented and we get the progressive income tax uh, as a result of trying to lower property taxes of all things. Uh, and at one time, uh, 1975, believe it or not, I, I was alarmed when I saw this. We had... Uh, our top rate was 13% with 13 brackets. And then eventually we get down to nine brackets. But if we look at our flat tax, um, what they did in 2022, you know, we go from nine brackets down to one low bracket of 3.9%. And I looked at in 2026, where is Iowa going to stand uh, nationally? And, uh, and, and keep in mind at that time, a lot of people push back and say, well, you know, Iowa's uh, uh, rate wasn't really that bad. But you have to take in consideration that at that time, federal deductibility as well as numerous tax credits uh, cushioned the high rates. They disguised it. But in 2026, Iowa will have uh, the fourth lowest income tax, or I, I should say- uh, four of, of the states that- Of the states. an income tax. Yes, yeah. And so nine states do not have an income tax. And so we'll, when we get 3.9 in 2026, the only states that will be lower than us are all have flat taxes except for one, 
Uh, Arizona will have a 2.5% flat tax. Uh, Indiana, which always had a flat tax, will be down to 2.9%. North Dakota, which tried to do a flat tax, but then they have two brackets, but their top bracket is 2.5%. And Pennsylvania will have a 3.07% flat tax. And so then Iowa comes in at 3.9%. And then slightly ahead of higher than us uh, is North Carolina, Ohio, Nebraska, which each have uh, uh, North Carolina uh, has a flat tax, but the other states, Ohio, Nebraska, don't. But uh, they'll be 3.99%, so slightly higher. So if you think of it, this is what Iowa did is highly significant in terms of just the not only the comprehensive nature of the reform, but going from our extensive progressive income tax down to a flow, a low flat tax rate, mm-hmm. is very historic. And, and especially if, if, as the governor and legislative leaders have hinted, they want to do more. I mean, Iowa, I would say, certainly is now the gold standard for state tax policy in terms of the most extensive and pro-growth uh, policy that has been enacted. Yeah, John, and so to summarize, as best we can tell, these things are not a, a perfect science to go back and research mm-hmm. you know, 100 years worth state by state. But this, this, this tax reform journey we've been on starting 18 through the 2022 cuts, technically three reforms, but it's kind of just been one yes. continual yeah. movement, right? We think that is probably the most extensive um, sort of set of income tax reforms that we've ever, that's ever we've ever done in this country, yes, right? Yeah. I mean, to, to go from that high yeah. rate to a low flat yeah. rate is, is, is even, something. even North Carolina, which, um, uh, you may start their reform much earlier than us. Uh, I think their high rate was a little over 7%. And we're starting, we were starting what? Eight, 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 nine, eight, 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 eight when eight, you guys nine, started. Eight, yeah. Eight, nine. Yeah. 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 You know, the, the, so. one thing, the one thing I, I might <laughs> offer a correction or, or, or just to put an asterisk in what you said, John, is you're talking like, we're going to get to the planned rate in 2026. Mm-hmm. And um, some of the people at the Capitol might want to go lower than the planned rate even by 2026. Oh, so, uh, I, I, so, I so, so, so the, yeah. the flat rate we get in 26 I, might even be lower than as, 3.9. As we'll part see. of this, uh, this five-year project that we're on yeah. is we do not allow the, the you know, before a bill yeah. becomes fully implemented, we pass another one to do it even better. So yeah, I, I think the Senate established a, a framework this last right. session with their bill. I mean, for to build on in 2024. And yep. I... I I mean, I, I think the the we have a great potential to do that. Here, here's what I think about where we're at now, uh, and I suppose it's a little bit subjective. Um, obviously, there's the numbers of where we where we went, but I I have no problem saying that Iowa over the last five years, as as one collective effort, is the biggest effort to cut income taxes in the history of this nation. Yeah. Yes. It, that means something. And yeah. and we're not done because it there are more cuts on the horizon, hopefully this year. And, you know, I'm sure that I could, there's some progressive some here that's, that's screaming Kansas if they're listening mm-hmm. to this. This has all been done out of the overpayment of those taxes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. This has not been done of slicing budgets yes it has not been done by cutting revenue and hoping that it works out later it is done we know that the state budget cash flows on its historic growth rate of where we're at and where we expect to be going now has has the state legislature been very frugal or prudent in how it's budgeted yes but they're not going through and and Mm-hmm. And and just sl- carving away huge swaths of the. That's there was right. no ten percent cut to education, Chris. No, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, nor are we, you know, taking Medicaid coverage away from a bunch of people. We're just running it the way it's supposed to be run. So it's, yeah. I, it is not only is it the biggest tax cut set of packages in the history of this country. It's all been done. Very above board, R- responsibly, responsibly yeah. sustainably built on fiscal responsibility, the way you would want to see it done. 
you know, I, I think, and this is where I think, you know, Governor Reynolds is a national leader because she has demonstrated that you can have substantial pro-growth tax reforms combined with prudent budgeting. And as you've said, Chris, nothing, there's been no meat cleaver taken to the budget. I mean, education has not been cut. Nothing has been cut. Uh, it's just spending has been slowed. And all the, all the liberals can do is say that, well, you're not spending enough. And they, of course, they never define what is enough. The growth of spending has been slowed. Yes. I mean, that's very important. This, the state budget is still growing yes. year over yeah. year. Okay. And we're cutting taxes. Yeah. It's a, Okay, good. I mean, that's... I, I, I look... Weird. I'm going to claim it until somebody brings me information that proves me wrong is that singular point that this is the best record on tax policy in the history of the Republic. And, and if they it prove is. us wrong and then we're, it's only the second greatest then, then round, we'll be, like then we'll be second best. Great. So great okay. challenge. The challenge has been laid out to anyone from another state or another era. Yeah. Prove us wrong. Whatever we have to do to get first, Will, that'll be the, that'll be the mission. you Yeah. Right. So very good. Well, John, we'll have some uh, light reading for folks on on yeah. this issue, right? Yeah, I was the the flagship for pro growth economic policy. Flagship and gold standard. Yes. Yeah. Good. All right. I like it. All right, gentlemen. Well, I think that's all the time we got for today. Uh, appreciate you uh, joining us. Uh, uh, as always, don't forget to leave us a five star review. Subscribe on YouTube. Uh, do whatever you need to do to make our numbers look better. And so we appreciate you joining us today. And with that, stay cool out there. And we will see you next time on ITR Live.